In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, one God. Amen. I believe he will come again to judge the living and the dead. This is one of the articles of our creed. And therefore, it is an article of faith which we view as essential. You could even say dogmatic. That's to say that there are a lot of things about the Christian faith in which there's a wide latitude of opinion and thought. But there are some things that are central, that are core, and therefore unchangeable, non-negotiable, considered to have been revealed by God, and therefore worthy and required of our acceptance and belief. And this is one of them, the return of Jesus Christ. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. It's not a metaphorical statement, and it's not symbolic either. It's one of those things that actually means what it says. And we know this on the authority of the Lord himself, because when he ascended into heaven and disappeared from the sight of the apostles, they heard the voice of angels speaking to them and saying, why do you look up into heaven? Why are you staring into the clouds? This Jesus who has ascended into heaven will one day return again the same way that he came. Now the problem, of course, is that he didn't put a date on that event. And if you read letters like Paul's two letters to the Thessalonians, we heard from the first one today, you find that uh, Paul, along with everybody else in early Christianity, thought that Jesus was going to come back right away. They thought he had just gone up for a short while, you know, take a little break from all the salvation stuff, and then would come back to finish the job. But of course, centuries came and went. And ever since then, people have wondered, when? When is it going to happen? In the year 1000, most of us were not present for that. But in the year 1000, there was great apocalyptic fervor the millennium. I mean, surely he's going to come back now. He didn't. Then in between then and now, there have been all kinds of predictions. There are people who make it their full-time job, practically, to comb through the scriptures and try and figure out dates and times and places, and yet he hasn't come yet. The year 2000 came and went, and believe it or not, we still have computers and internet networks. <laughs> Jesus has not uh, come back again. So what are we to make of it? Does it mean that he's not coming? Well, if we believe the faith that we confess with our mouth in the Nicene Creed, no, it doesn't mean that he's not coming again. It just means that he hasn't yet. And for many of us, thank God he hasn't yet. <laughs> In the Sundays leading up to the first Sunday of Advent, we'll hear a lot of readings from both the Old Testament and the New Testament that talk about the less pleasant themes of Scripture. Themes like judgment, the day of the Lord, clouds and darkness, and all those kinds of things. And while we might rather just sort of glaze over those, they are important. And they serve a great purpose in our, in our spiritual lives. I think there are two uh, equal but opposite responses to the whole concept of Jesus Christ coming again. The first, which I already mentioned, is the constant attempt to figure out which part of the news is fulfilling biblical prophecy and, uh, so that we can somehow kind of pinpoint the date and the time and all of these kinds of things. Never mind that Jesus himself said... Uh, not even the Son knows the date and the hour of His coming again. But then on the other hand, and I think this is more of a pervasive problem in the mainline church, is just apathy and neglect of that truth altogether. Well, He hasn't come in low these 2017 years. Surely He won't come in my lifetime. And scientist Stephen Hawking, you know, just came out with a prediction that the sun was going to burn us all up in about 650 years. I think I'm good. 650 years. 
But the fact remains of what Jesus said at the end of this morning's gospel, which is, you know, neither the day nor the hour. And he tells a parable about being prepared for that moment. He tells the parable of the ten maidens. Now, of course, it's a parable, so it's not something that actually happened, but it is something that could, uh, that, that could happen. Uh, that's how weddings went in first century Palestine. And at any rate, there are ten maidens. Five of them have lamps and extra oil so that they can keep their lamps burning until the bridegroom arrives. Five others did not. Who knows why? Probably because they just figured, well, he'll be here in good time. It's the, it, it, it's the wedding feast. Of course he'll be here in good time. So I'm good with just what I have right now. Well, of course, the bridegroom was delayed. In other words, he did not come when everybody expected him to come. More time passed than people expected, and five of the maidens found themselves with lamps that were out, which was a sign of not being prepared, not being ready for the coming of the bridegroom. And so they wanted to borrow from the ones who had, and the ones who had said, eh, there might not be enough for all of us, so why don't you just go to the oil store and get some oil? So they did. And while they're at the oil store, the bridegroom comes back and lets in those who were ready and then shuts the door. And when those who had gone to the oil store got back, they found themselves shut out of the wedding feast. And that is a cautionary tale for believers, not only back then, but believers now. Sometimes we neglect this truth of the second coming of our Lord Jesus Christ because we don't want to fall into the caricature, caricatures and the errors of the kind of wild-eyed doomsday prophets. But at the same time, we still confess, Sunday after Sunday, that he will come again to judge the living and the dead. The question is, how do we prepare? How do we prepare? What is Jesus telling us in this parable? Well, number one... He tells us that in the spiritual life, there are some things that simply cannot be obtained at the last minute. There are some things that just can't be obtained at the last minute. I had a professor in college once who made it his policy uh, to not put any of the tests on the schedule, except for the big ones like the midterm and the final. But other than that, quizzes, little unit exams, nothing. We show up, boom, it's there. Why did he do that? Because he was a big meanie? Well, he was, but that's not why. It's not why he did it. He did it because he wanted to get into our heads the idea of being prepared at all times. Of being prepared at all times. In other words, not just waiting until the last minute and then cramming as much into our heads as we could possibly stuff and then dumping the data out on the test, and then forgetting it for the rest of our lives. Which is what happens many times when you know exactly, when you know exactly when the test is going to be, you can just slide and wait, and at the last minute, just try and stuff it all in there, just long enough to be able to regurgitate it for the exam. Well, this professor didn't want us to do that. He, you know, he was a jerk, but he wanted us to learn something. He wanted us to learn something. The point of that is just, that's kind of what Jesus is illustrating here. There are some things in the spiritual life that cannot be put off until the last minute. Number one, because we don't know when the last minute is. It's easy to get into, uh, get into kind of a comfortable pattern, a complacent pattern where we don't really think about these things too much. And, and thank God for readings like this and for the whole season of Advent, for that matter, which remind us to keep these things in the forefront of our minds. The second thing that it, uh, this passage reminds us is not only that there are certain things that cannot be put off to the last minute, but there are aspects of the spiritual life which cannot be borrowed from somebody else. We cannot borrow a relationship with God from somebody else. 
We cannot borrow repentance from somebody else. We cannot borrow faith from somebody else. Now that doesn't mean that sometimes we have to lean on others for their faith when we're going through hard times. But we cannot stand before the judgment seat of Christ having no preparation whatsoever and say, well, my mama was a good Christian. That's great for mama. But it won't do anything for us because that was mama's oil and not ours. We cannot put things off until the last minute and we cannot borrow from others. So what's the whole takeaway from this? The whole takeaway from this is to be prepared. To be prepared at all times. Because we never know if Jesus will come back during this service, or whether he'll come back a thousand years from now, or ten thousand years from now, or whatever the case may be, we just don't know. So we focus on what we do know. We focus on the fact that he will come again to judge the living and the dead, and we focus on those things that prepare us for that. And those things are very simple. They're not complicated at all. They don't involve becoming these great spiritual athletes. They don't involve cloistering ourselves in some religious community. No, none of that. The way I've heard it best expressed is that the best way to prepare for the coming of Jesus Christ is to live each day as if he's already here. The best way to prepare for the coming of Jesus Christ is to live every day as if he was already here. Because really, he is. It's a great paradox of our faith that we say Jesus sits at the right hand of the Father in heaven, and yet he's also present with us as well, but he is. He's present with us by the Holy Spirit in our hearts, through baptism and confirmation. He's with us in the most holy sacrament of the altar in his body and blood. He's with us as we gather as his body, the church, to hear his word and to celebrate his sacraments. And he's present with us in the hearts of other believers who know and love him and who know and love us. And so we ask ourselves, how would Jesus want us to live? Well, he hasn't left that to mystery. We have his word, which lays out clearly his call to follow him and to be disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ. But we know that each and every day is an opportunity to live in repentance. Not just saving it for big occasions or big sins, but, but living each day, examining our hearts, confessing our sins, and seeking once again, time and again, to turn away from our sin and turn towards the Lord. The prepared life is, is a life that is seeking to grow in Christian charity and Christian virtue. The prepared life is a life that is directed not towards the self, but directed towards the service of others. A prepared life is quite simply a life of following the Lord Jesus Christ as he calls us to do so. And so, as uh, that, that is the oil in our lamps. The oil of faith. That is the oil that we are to keep on hand at all times so that we might keep the flame of faith alive and burning at all times. So that whenever our Lord Jesus Christ comes again, he will find in us that flame. He won't find us scrambling at the last minute to try to get something in that lamp, but rather he will find a well-trimmed lamp full of oil and with more to spare. That's what it means to be prepared, and we don't need to know when he's coming back in order to be prepared for that. May the Holy Spirit convict our hearts where we need to be convicted, comfort us where we need to be comforted, and above all things, help us with his grace to prepare for the day that the bridegroom returns in order that we may be brought in with him to the eternal wedding feast wherein is joy and peace everlasting. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.